take this to them, right? Yes. Okay. Uh, for right now, because if not, it echoes. So okay. okay. Too close. The other question I had for you. Do, you, do you want me to be up here when they're presenting, or do you want me to show you and you want me to do it? It's up to you, whichever one you prefer. Because, um, uh, you know, the only thing is, like, when you, you just take that one all the way down. When you do slideshow, remember, yeah, it's up here. And you I know, just duplicate, duplicate, and that's it. Yeah. Um, so it's your, I mean, I don't mind. But so far, not all. We'll just, be on the lookout. Yeah, we'll just make sure. Um, yeah, I mean, it probably would be good. Okay. Because that's what we well, did last year, yeah. I can bring up Shemings and take care of that. So okay. So this you you want just yes. stuff for yes. this, right? Yeah. Okay. I guess it's time to go. Good morning. All right, I'll try that again. Good morning. Good morning. All right. So this is going to seem late because tomorrow starts at 8.30. So uh, hopefully you got some sleep this morning. So. Um, thank you for uh, uh, getting yourselves here for the 2017 uh, OR meeting. Um, we're happy to have such a full room here. Um, a couple of administrative announcements. Uh, well, actually, there's a, a little bit of, uh, I have some bad news and um, some good news. And um, I'm bending over here. So. Um, the, the, the bad news is that uh, Larissa is unable to join us uh, today from, um, from Russia. Um, what happened was it, with the reduction, the force reduction at the uh, embassy in Moscow, um, even though we were working with our Congressman uh, Dingle here in the offices at, here at Ann Arbor, she was not able to get an interview for her visa, so she's unable to um, was unable to get out of Moscow, um, which is really too bad for for uh, for that reason. Um, but actually, for another reason, she was actually the one that inspired this uh, this this uh, session this morning because uh, she contacted me and said, "Hey, I'd like to come and uh, talk to people about." about Jazda. So um, so that's the bad news. The good news is is that I'm not going to necessarily take you through the slides. Just I'm going to point out a couple things. I'm not going to try and do a Russian accent or anything like that. But, um, but I do want to make sure that you realize that what she did send us was, and everyone should have one of these in your packet, um, is a, a flyer that uh, is uh, basically a lot of what the slides that she has here. I have extra ones that I'll put over uh, when I'm walking over, or I'll actually just put them here. You can pick them up once we're completed. So if you want extra, if you find that somehow um, the master stuffing committee um, missed it or something and it's not in your packet, you can uh, feel free to get some extras here. The other, um, the other way to get the information is that we have already posted these on the online program under uh, presentation materials. And effectively, it's the same information that's on the flyer. And it has, very importantly, the contact information on the last slide. So um, this is the International Data Panel, and we have Xu Ming from the China Data Center here at the University of Michigan. We have Anya, who is with us from GASIS. Did I say that correctly? Very good. And we have Hirsch, who is here from the UK Data Archive. The way we're going to handle it today is that um, each presenter will talk about their, their data, their archive, how to access it. Then they're going to answer a few questions from the audience. Do note that we are live streaming, so hi to anyone that is out there. Um, so if you have a question, we're going to have to run this, uh, this old-fashioned microphone out to you, ask a question, and then we'll have to make sure that you guys are um, 
that are speaking through the microphone. Otherwise, they uh, all they can see are our mouths moving on the other end of the live stream. Um, and then they will also spend some time up here for other questions that come about um, towards the end or at the end of the session. So with that, I just wanted to uh, take you through a couple of the slides here um, from the archive, uh, the Joint Economic and Sociological Data Archive at the Higher School of Economics in Moscow. Um, just a, a couple of pointers on this on this particular slide is at present um, JUSTA is storing more than 3,500 data sets and they have about a few thousand users who visit the site every month. So um, it looks like uh, they uh, they launched it in 2000 so we're at about uh, what are we now 2017 17 years now and um, already 3500 data sets uh, for your information I um, actually talked to Bob Ray Borderland who is here um, and cause, because I know him as my super international data person and um, he said he that he hasn't actually downloaded the micro data but he has done downloaded some of the statistical tables was that right so and then um, we had a, a staff member who um, applied for access and downloaded some data and worked around with with it so some micro data so this is absolutely accessible to you so there is a, a, a app, application process I think you have to wait it took a couple days of course we have time differences going on a couple days to get that access but indeed she was able to download a few selected data sets um, the depositor list again is in your um, is in the flyer, but you can see the type of data producers that are putting data in JASDA. Um, and uh, again, the about 1,500 surveys she said with um, and free access for teaching and research. Users in Russia and all this again is in the slides or in the flyer that she provided us. But very importantly, here's the site, her email address with for any questions, and um, please do explore this database. I think um, it's a looks like it's some great resource for you and some great data um, in in uh, Moscow and about Russia. So with that, I'm going to transition over to Shuming. Give us a moment to get through the high technical pieces of, of uh, exchanging the slides here. I'd ask for questions but um, uh, regarding JASDA, but uh, I would have to refer you to the, to the email address. All right, Shuming. All right, thank you. Well, good morning. And this panel is uh, called International Data Panel. And so I'm the director of the China Data Center, but also maybe you noticed uh, there's a called Spatial Data Center. We start uh, from the China Data Center. So this year is our 20 years anniversary. We start China Data Center in 90, 97, all right, thank you, yeah. <laughs> but when we start that, there are not many data on international for international studies, especially for China. And so for 20 years, we start to build a kind of the international partnership and with China, and also with some other different agencies, and make some the China data available, accessible, and also the apply, promote the China data to the different uh, the China studies. But when we work on the China data, we realized it's not only the China data. If we want to understand the China, you cannot only know the China. You cannot only have the China data. So then we start to expand uh, our data, the connections and a service from the China data to some other region. So that's how we now we start also the new, the name called Spatial Data Center and to expand the ASRA International Data Center. So the way we are working on, on the China, and when we find, uh, so once uh, we, if we were to work on China, you have to, you have, to have international view. And this is uh, some pictures, and we, from our the comparative studies. So that's you know, the motivation why we are China the Center need to expand uh, to the different, uh, the international the data studies. If you look at the data from different countries, we find uh, actually it doesn't matter probably any countries, 
Yeah, some, most, many people always say, well, China is special. But if you look at some data, China is not special. If you look at some major patterns, China and the US has many similar the patterns and the trend. So this is manufacturing trend in the US. And we see the manufacturing, the term of the firm, number of firm, and uh, the number of the employment has been declining. And from 1970s, but the GDP, actually the manufacturing, the GDP of the manufacturers keep growing. So this is uh, the, what happened in the US, but there are probably there are many stories behind this one. There might be it's a globalization or maybe improvement of the efficiency, productivity. So there are many other the, the new technology. So this is what happened in the US. If you look at the data in China, China actually also is, has a similar trend, but probably in a different development stage. So China's the employment, the number of the firms in manufacturing also start to decline recently, especially after the 2010. And also percentage of GDP have also keep declining. It's very clear. But even the total GDP in manufacturing has been keep growing. So the China-US has a similar trend and a similar pattern. The only difference is a different development stage. This is for manufacturing. But also, we, if you look at the spatial pattern, not only the times the change, the structure changes with the time. If you look at the spatial pattern, the spatial pattern also has significant change in the US and China. This is a landscape for the manufacturing in the US. So you can see for this manufacturer for medical the equipment. And they, ha they have been in a concentrated in some region. So finally, they have the saver, the cluster for the medical equipment. This not only happened to medical equipment, but also happened to many other industries. Mm -hmm. Similar the trend also happened in China. If you look at China, medical equipment, you can see they're concentrated initially from very diverse initially, but then finally they concentrated in some region. Not only the industries, but also population. If you look at the population in the US, you can see this is based on a track map, and we work on beer for the US data. So our US chips will allow us to track how the population and the change at the tract neighbor. So if you have to the county neighbor, if you look at the state neighbor, you probably didn't realize what's changed there. But when you look at down the, the population at tract neighbor, you can see significant change there. The central US, north US, north population, right? This is from 1970 to 2010. In last 50 years, the population has been north in many the central north the, in the US. So this is enormous. Even the total population in the US has been increased a world high. If you look at China, the similar pattern, the China, this is based on the county data, because we don't have you know, the small, smaller unit and for the population consistent the comparable. This is population data based on the county neighbor. And from 2000 to 2010, just 10 years, you can see the population north in the central China and also north China. So that's a similar pattern as the US. Even the total population keep growing. So those pictures and, uh, can help us to see what kind of the, the dynamics between, in the US and China. So you can see there are significant change in the landscape in terms of the population, in terms of industry. So we need to understand, uh, so this is a global issue. I, I didn't do anything on the European Union and, and other region, but I believe there are probably a similar pattern. So we need to understand the global dynamics of the population and the business. So we need to understand which industry are growing or shrinking in terms of the number of the business employee sales. And also where industry are growing or shrinking and in terms of the number of the business employee and sales. So even some employ some industries growing or some industry declining, but they are not kind of consistent and over space. So some place are kind of growing, some place are declining. And also, what's the link between the population and the business in terms of the change in space to world high? So those are kind of the dynamics of our study, our research, try to understand macro name, micro name. So for those kind of studies, we can see their kind of interlinkage between 
in the, within the system. Mostly, urine, our research is focused on some field or specialist, right? Right. Most of the, now, if you want to understand uh, this dynamics or this kind of complex system, we need the data from all the different kind of the aspects. So this is the China data and the U.S. data we have been working on, and since uh, within the last 20 years. For China data, we start to build up a, se a series, the statistics data, population data, the economic sense data, and the business data, and also environment data. So those data has been and compiled at different administrative levels. So from the one square kilometer zip code, township, country, and city, and province. For US data, we also have the comparable the data start from the block, tractor, and CCD, country, metropolitan, and the state. So all those data include a population sense from different years, and also bin data from different years. So those data now allow us to look into inside how, what's uh, the change of the structure of the population and the business, and also what's the change of the spatial pattern and over time. So those information provide a very important uh, the comparable data and for understand this kind of dynamics and global dynamics. So if we can understand uh, and what happened in the US and China, and it can help us to understand uh, what's going on in any other country and region, in the past and also in the future. So this brings the challenges, how to access to those data. So the current most data service kind of similar to our data kind. So you put the data set on the server, and the people, they can download the data. Or you can maybe deliver data in a CD, a DVD, or by emails. But now we have the data can be very huge, not like for China data. We have about uh, more than 6,000 uh, variables across the country at any different neighbors, from the township, from the county, from the city, from the state. For the US, we have about more than 45,000 variables for any neighbors, from the block in the tract uh, county and uh, metropolitan state. You cannot say I were not to download everything to my desktop and then start to use the software to process this data. Now it's almost impossible. So the only solution is we need the, the, the build the system to have this data integrated. The data can be integrated for easy access and then also for comparable studies. So we can find uh, you know, how the US and where the US, where's China more similar, where's the dissimilar, and uh, where's the difference, and where's the, so what you can see the kind of the footprint there. So this is uh, the juice for we have been working and since 2008. So we're, and start build the, we start also, you know, start from very simple the GIS, the, the system. And then we generally build this kind of geospore and uh, to integrate our scanning data and into the online spatial system. So that now the geospore allow you to report data and to generate online map and uh, also to find, identify where is the bin is. And also, we can also integrate the data from the different uh, source, like the remote sense data and the historical religion data and also we provide uh, many online functions for online analysts, not some the static state and the chart and graphs and spatial visualizations. So this is uh, the interface of the China GX4. And this China GX4 has the data, the sense data from 2010, 2000, and also several data from the previous census, and also business sense data and economic data from different years and different scales. And also, that's a similar for the U.S. GX4, and we build up. So in the, in the U.S., where for China data, probably say many data because we have the many data for China data, it's very unique because we work and with uh, National Bureau of Statistics. So there are many data actually we are get from the first scan, not from the pop, uh, official publications. So many data you are probably cannot find from official publications, majority of data. But for U.S. data, the many data probably you can not some sense data, population sense, you can find from the U.S. Bureau of Census, but the big challenge is the boundary will be changed where the census. Every census they have changed that redefine or make some change to the tractor block metropolitan. So the data even are free, but it takes time. 
work on that one. Almost it's impossible for most scholars, for most students, if they don't have advanced skills, and also if they don't have the extensive the data source. So that's bringing some challenges. Also, the US government don't release the detailed data from the economic sense and business data. So those bring some challenges for US studies. So we have been, at NACNET, we have been work with some, some US, some the companies, and make this data available so, and uh, comparable across the US. So now we also build the US that you explore so they can compare with China. So this is some features of the US and the China to explore. So we provide kind of natural data snatching. So you can snap data by circle, by rectangle, polygon, or you can define your polygon. So if this is a region, not some I will find this score distributor. I don't have this kind of any publications, but I, I can define my region and then we can react to the data. And uh, based on the population science data, economic data we have, business data, and also you can generate the new data set. Next time you can generate data by X, Y coordinate and also by circle. Say so I would like to find how many population, how many the, within this say five miles and from here. And how many the stores and food stores and restaurants and within the five miles, three miles. And also it provides many easy functions for time saving report charts and maps and also provide some multiple formats for data export. And also they can integrate the user data so you can upload your data for online mapping or for online report or analysis. And also we can allow you to do the China-US comparison. So easily go into the China, in the China to where are the state of, in any state, any province, and find out what kind of the structure in terms of age structure, population housing structure, education, and where's the similarity between one province and other province, and how between one province of China and also other states in the US. Similar for any US, you can pick up any state, you can find uh, which province in China is similar to your state. So that provides, because in China, US, we can consider it as a united uh, state union, right? If we compare to the, uni the European Union. Every state can similar to countries. China similar. Every province in China, it's kind of a country scale. It's different. So it's important to understand uh, and which for the state and the province that are comparable. So the, the, now even we have the, the huge, now a big connection of the data for US and China studies. This is still not enough to understand the dynamics of global, the change there. Because there's uh, the classification, a feature classification is not good enough, it's not big enough to define this complex system. So there's a many kind of the different industry, not some the score, high score. And for, we have the different kind of the high score, private, public. For the, the, the university, we have the different level of university. They probably have the, the top one, the tire one, tire two, tire different tires, right? So those data, you know, the many different, even the many different classification, you, you probably cannot find a good test from official statistics. So the, so now with the big data, provide opportunity, new opportunity for those the global studies, for those complex system the studies. Where the advantage, but when we have the big data, the big data doesn't re will not replace the baseline data. So we can find uh, the, the baseline data, even so the, the sense data, many people saw where maybe our survey data, maybe the sense data, maybe people will not need this kind of data anymore. No, that's not correct. Those, uh, the, the traditional, the data connected, and actually the four kind of standard were defined. So provide a kind of very important baseline data, we call it baseline data. So that baseline data has very good representative, and you know, say what's the state or, or the countries. And they form kind of standard for data connection and procedures. And also they have very good quality control. That's ITPSR data, and different than the many other survey data, you probably can download it from the, or different place or individual sources. And the, the, the issues, the problems for this baseline data, maybe, maybe can, can be outdated. Like some data we have for census, the, the newest one is 2010. For economic sense, the newest one is 2013. So it's already in the, the, the several years past. 
And also, they have limited coverage. They probably only cover the based on the question errors they're connected, right? So the many question errors, they're not connected by the census or by the standard survey. So that's uh, why our, the, they have different projects for different survey. And also, it's very expensive, right? To connect those kind of nationwide data, it uh, only can be and support by the government. And so the big data provide a kind of the complementary value for our baseline data. So one is the, 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 the good the advantage is they provide a very extensive coverage. Basically, you can cover everything, right, any topic. And also, they can be provide a high spatial temporal resolution. Like some, if you use the social media, if you use cell phone, you can find the actual X, Y locations. And uh, but for most of the, the government data, they, they don't provide uh, the precise locations. And also, data can keep updating. It can keep updated. The last minute, the data can be from, connected from the internet. But the issue is uh, any big data you can find uh, and from any source, the kind of sample data. But you, the problem is you don't know what's the combination of this sample. So that's kind of issue. And also, it's unstructured, and many of kind of data are separate from the different source. And, uh, and also, there's uh, many missing data there, and also many noisy there. So that's kind of issue of the big data. So that kind of the problem of big data actually can be and uh, actually and make up by our baseline, the data from the government of, of sort the resource. So we are been working and try to integrate the big data with GIS4. So with the GIS4, basically, and for to integrate the big data, so the, the number one we need to the the text line, the text nominalization, and convert the the non-structured data into the structured data, and convert the text data into the numeric data, and also specialization. And for many data, probably they don't have specific uh, the location. So we have to identify and where is the based location and based uh, and then integrate it with our spatial data and other data. And also visualization. And uh, with uh, the increasing the, the size of the big data, how to visualize data, how to visualize the data in not only the size, but also the term in different structures. So this is kind of the the our explore work for how to integrate the big data for the China and also global studies. So this is uh, the ones that we are and at the web search and into our GIS4. Basically, you can enter any keywords. And any keywords say, I would like to find outdoor activities. I would like to find, uh, say, the Buddhist. I would like to find, uh, say, indoor activities or indoor sports. So those probably you cannot find any statistics for this kind of data. And based on the web search, and we can find, OK, where's, uh, where's which region has more active, more attention and uh, for those keywords. And then we can find uh, the use uh, the, by the different uh, the province or different state, different uh, the counties. Then we can generate a spatial table. And, the, and also, they can generate the map. So in this way, we can convert the data from non-structured data to the structured data and convert from non-spatial data to spatial data, text data to numeric data, and also the advantages because there's unlimited keyword. We can generate unlimited data. And those data can provide a complementary data and to the baseline data and for any analysis. So we build, can build online coordination, the metrics, and uh, immediately once we you know, get the result from the search by the different keywords, so we did some pilot studies for different regions in China. The system, the results are very consistent with our the analysts use the data from economic sense data. So this is an example how to and, uh, integrate the data from web crawling. So we can properly crawl the data from the different uh, the conference papers and the different uh, journal papers, and then find uh, where the location, say where's the location of the, the spatial distribution of the authors. And where the spatial distribution of the different uh, the topics, like some crimes. And then we can generate a map and from, so this data also convert from a text data. And this is uh, the big data from social media. So we applied, can use uh, like some QQ Twitter data 
and find uh, you know, where, the Topka, where the people and where the top got treated from the different region. Where the people and use a QQ and, uh, and from the different uh, the place. And, and what time and uh, where so they can keep the, the last minute, keep the, all the updated data. So the challenge is here. So there's many opportunities now uh, how to integrate the big data, baseline data, survey data for the China, US, and the global studies. The challenge is, because we have more diversified uh, the data source, and with the increasing data source size. The data size has been double, triple, and every day. So, so it's uh, how to, and as a second, uh, how to improve our working efficiency. Because uh, for this kind of procedures, we probably need uh, you know, the, a series. You need to understand uh, what's uh, kind of the, the software process data, the GIs. And also, for the interdisciplinary studies, Entry cost is pretty high. You need to understand uh, the different softwares. So that, that's our future directions. We we'll work on how to you know, develop uh, the scalable, the spatial data service, and for increasing the data the service. And also, we we'll not to build the workflow-based uh, spatial data service. So all the different procedures can be and uh, finished uh, just one by button, and that can be configured, and that can improve the the research efficiency the very, the, uh, very efficiently. And also the knowledge-based uh, spatial data coverage, discovery. And uh, so for the people, uh, most people work on probably some field, but when you have work on the, not the whole complex system, you need to work on a different field. So the knowledge-based uh, spatial data discovery can help you to find the data, find topic, uh, find the relationship across the boundary, across a different field. So that's the project and some project and we are working on. All right, thank you. Any questions? Yeah. Okay. I guess you want to record this, okay, all right. Shall I look toward the camera? <laughs> uh, thank you very much, Shuming. This is very interesting material. Uh, I went up to the website, I have two questions for you. One is about the 2010 data, and the other is about access. Um, I went to your website and I don't see tables for 2010 uh, in the area that I was looking on population census data. And so my question is, uh, are the are they available from your website? Uh, yes. Excellent. All right. <clears throat> well, maybe I went to the wrong place. <clears throat> yeah, I think that say the China data online dot org. There's a, the two different places. Here the sense data under China the sense maps. You can find uh, the data sense data for 2010, 2000, uh, and also economic sense data from different sources. But if you want tables, can you get it there also? Uh, yes. So okay. All right. Here, great. Great. Okay. I, I will explore further. So then. this is uh, the there's a map, and also you can download the data in the Excel file. You can switch between say our life to have the city, county. I can download the data into the Excel file. Here. All right. Yeah. Um, now uh, the second was about the access. Now is this particular one free or because uh, one of the problems is. Uh, when I go up to access it, uh -huh. is I don't know if my library has a subscription or not. Yeah, in the yeah, Minnesota, right? Minnesota have full access for data set. And also we provide, a, so if you don't see the free mapping, the free mapping for those that will try to make the data accessible by everyone, uh -huh. in different, uh, probably in different neighbors. So all our data, you can, if you don't have the subscription, you can always get from this free mapping. Free mapping is the same data, everything okay. is the same, but you can get access to the map. Not if you don't have access to the full data set, but you can access yeah. the map. Also, you can upload your map. And, and so from this, I could get, say, a table of age by sex yes. yeah, by county, map. by county. Right, right, right. Yeah. All right, great, thank you very much. So we are trying to make the data accessible by everyone, but you know, depend on different neighbors.
because we also need to survive, right? Yeah. <laughs> Hi, I'm actually from Minnesota. My name is Alicia, and I have a question related to that. Um, whenever I use, we have a subscription to China Data Online and then the China Geo Explorer. Uh -huh. And I always struggle when I'm on your website figuring out what we actually have access to and what we don't and what the, the difference is. Um, so if you could maybe speak a little bit to that, I just get really confused when I'm trying to figure out, you know, what are we paying for and what is freely accessible. Okay. So if you see there's a, if you see the arrow here, then that means you have access. Okay. And, so and also here is you can see my account. My account will show you what you have access here. So okay. So what is that. the difference, I guess? So what, when we have that subscription, what are we getting that people who don't have it? Uh huh. Don't right. get where so so if you if you have access, then you can get access to all the data behind this. So you can you know get search the table and retrieve the table, and uh, so if the people don't have access, then they don't have the subscription, they will not get access to these four data. So, yeah. so is it more the geographic units that are different? Okay. The let's say. For the, if you don't have access to China to score, you can only get access to the map, not the data behind the map. Oh, okay, I see. So okay. You can export the map and uh, use that for your presentation, publication, but not the original data. Okay, so great, China thank score, you. You can access and to original data, but also there's many different functions for you to query the data, extract the data, reorganize the data. Okay, great, thank you. All right. Okay, thank you. Welcome, my name is Anja, I'm from Gesis, the um, Gesis Data Archive in Cologne in Germany, and I'm very happy to be here and to be able to present um, Gesis and the Data Archive to you. Um, so, okay, so first uh, I must say I actually chose a little bit of a different focus. Um, I'm not going to be talking so much. Are you here? Okay. Uh, so much about our data and I'm actually going to talk more about our services in general, reaching from um, research data management, archiving, preservation and also data access. Um, first of all, I would like to um, introduce GESIS to you. Um, GESIS is a research institute, but it's also a service and infrastructure provider for the so social sciences in Germany. And we offer um, uh, research-based services, which means that almost all of our employees ha are researchers. They have a research topic that they're working on uh, for a third of their time, and for two-thirds of their time, they are providing services to the research community. And we are providing services all around the research data life cycle um, that you can see here. So uh, researchers can search for information and for data at GESIS. Uh, we help them in study planning. We offer a pretest lab where they can test their survey questions. Um, we help them with sampling methods. Uh, we also provide workshops for data analysis. And also, um, and that's why I'm here today, we offer um, data archiving and data registration. Um, so I'm working at the Data Archive for the Social Sciences, and this is actually the oldest department of GESIS, and it was established in 1960, which makes us two years older than the ICPSR, as I learned yesterday. And uh, 10 years ago, when GESIS was established, um, we became um, a department of GESIS. And also what I learned yesterday, if you want to know about an institution, you should read their mission. And our mission is to advance the social science research and promoting uh, wide, wide data sharing and providing a rich data resource. 
And we are also part of SESTA. Um, SESTA is the consortium of European Social Science Data Archives. There are currently 16 members in SESTA, um, and each member is represented by a single data archive, and uh, one of our partners is also here, UK Data. Um, and recently, this year, SESTA became an ERIC, uh, which probably doesn't mean so much uh, to you, or you're not very, very familiar with this term, but this is actually a long-term establishment of a research infrastructure, and uh, so SESTA this year was put on very stable financial ground. And SESTA provides large-scale integrated sustainable data services, and it's working on um, improving um, the possibilities for researchers across Europe to um, engage in research data management and make the data available to other researchers. And also one important part of uh, SESTA is training in research data management, and the SESTA trainings are actually also um, hosted by the GESIS Data Archive. And we have a very comprehensive uh, expertise in a number of areas, and these are data discovery, data usage, data processing, preservation, and support. And um, I'm going to talk about these um, five areas in more detail in a minute. Um, I just want to point out to you that during the recent years, we went through some uh, very profound structural changes at, G at the GESIS Data Archive. And in the past, we provided all of these services in one package, and it was um, always a very cumbersome uh, process to tailor um, our services to each um, each of our customers that came to us and uh, wanted to use our services. And for the last years, um, we broke down our products into different modules that are presented here in, as these boxes. Um, they're not exactly the same modules that we are going to roll out soon, um, but so they're, they're going to be much more detailed. However, um, we, with these modules that we created, we will be able to offer um, a much better tailoring towards our um, customers, so the researchers' needs that come to us that either want to use our data or come to us to preserve um, their data. And um, first of all, I'm going to talk about data discovery. And of course, here we have our data catalogs. Um, in which you can uh, search for studies um, on the study level and also for some uh, very central and very important studies you can search um, through the variable levels. And also we, every data that comes into our archive is registered, so it uh, receives a DOI. And uh, DARA, which is the German DOI registration service for the social sciences, is also hosted at GESIS, and we collaborate with DataSite. Um, regarding data usage, we have our data service, and here we offer about 5,700 national and international studies. Um, and we also host three research data centers, and in total, GESIS has five data research data centers, and these data centers, as well as GESIS itself, is part of a very large German uh, research data infrastructure, and research data centers usually cluster around one uh, large study that is typically very complex, and it provides its users um, very a comprehensive service uh, regarding um, how to analyze the data. They often like, they advise uh, users on how to analyze the data. Um, they also provide workshops and on data and analysis, but also very often workshops where people using the same uh, study can connect with each other and um, network. And also, this is where uh, ICPSR comes in. Um, also through our data service, uh, German researchers can access the ICPSR data, and uh, this is my role as, at GESIS as well. I'm the OR for, um, for ICPSR in Germany, and uh, for now, all the data requests on ICPSR go over my desk, so to say. Um, also, when we have highly restricted data, data that cannot be anonymized, for example, expert interviews or 
um, um, data on when we add additional data like on the municipality or street level um, this can be accessed, accessed in our um, secure data center it's a physical enclave in cologne we are working on collaborating with other enclaves so that not everyone has to travel to cologne um, and we are also working on remote access for this but this is um, these are plans for the future for now um, on processing, um, here we will distinguish um, between standard and premium level of data archiving in the future. Um, so before it was kind of a like one service that we offered to everyone and we always negotiated uh, what is best for a certain project. From now on we will um, offer our standard level of data archiving where we perform ingest control of course and documentation on study level to make this study findable in our data catalog. However, for larger studies that are very uh, important to the field and will reach a lot of researchers, we will offer a premium level of data archiving or added value. And here we will do intensive checks. Um, we offer commulations commu when um, studies cover different countries for example or different years and we provide a very comprehensive documentation on variable level our so-called variable reports that include the original question um, and also frequencies and cross tabs and the standard level of data archiving will remain cost free as it has always been but the premium level uh, we will charge for that because we will put a lot of manpower in it uh, in the future. And also um, preservation, we uh, offer long-term preservation using Bitstream and we document the data according to international standards and we are also um, we are also certified as a trusted digital repository. And this is another uh, point where ICPSR comes in. All the studies that get into our archive, uh, they are also listed at ICPSR. So all, also all the uh, GESIS studies that we have are accessible through ICPSR or at least findable through ICPSR. Then we also have self-deposit um, available. That's a very low threshold platform for smaller research projects. Um, we do some curation for the self-deposit, uh, but it's not as extensive as in the standard archiving process that we offer. Um, here we check, for example, for anonymization, um, whether uh, so to make sure that no person can be identified through a data set that just comes in through a Datorium, our self-deposit um, preservation. And also Datorium can be used, for example, to store your syntax. If a journal requires you to um, upload uh, your syntax that you used for your anal analysis in the paper, you can store it with Datorium. And the last column that is uh, support, um, of course, we advise survey researchers on uh, every step in the research process and we always welcome researchers to come to us very early on. Um, for example, um, this is unfortunately often the case that researchers want to store their data with us but they didn't have the informed consent by the people that they asked and so they with, without this consent they cannot store it at an archive and that's why we uh, always reach out to the researchers very early in the process to talk to us and discuss the informed consent with us but we also advise on data anonymization and data sharing, of course. We also provide uh, training, and this is partly done through SESTA. As I said, we offer SESTA training on research data management, on data processing, and data sharing, but we also have our own classes, and we do that in-house um, uh, in, in our workshops, and we also visit our clients if it's a research institute or a customer, a company that wants to have our service then we also travel to them and provide training. And we not only have uh, researchers as our, as our customers, we also, for example, provided, provided training to Telecom, the company behind uh, T-Mobile. Um, 
Also, we develop tools. Um, a lot of effort is put into search tools uh, to make our information that we gather at GESIS assess accessible to everyone. Um, and also, for example, we have a tool for data harmonization. If you use multiple surveys, you can smooth out the differences between the variables with this tool. And also, uh, we advocate open science, I guess. Um, all data sharing is open science and this is our mission. And here I just listed some projects, uh, products of ours and communities that we are part of that all work towards open science. I'm sure that there are many more um, and if you look at Gesus there are even more. Um, but this is what our mission to make data open and to allow open science. And this is already my last slide and I'm happy to take questions. Hi, Anya. Could you clarify a statement you made? Um, you said that the GESA studies were findable at a high level through ICPSR. Other than the German national election studies and Eurobarometer and, Can and the Canada barometers, I'm not aware of any studies showing up in the ICPSR interface. So what did you mean by that? Um, I I think that all the studies are reported or that they're listed in the ICPSR. That's that's what I was told. I can check into that if it's not working right. Or... They're not, and that okay. that would be you know really amazing. And I I would love to see yeah. the same with UKDA and the same with others mm -hmm. um, because you know your country and your country uh, you know you're wonderful. You provide the data for free, but of course we have to remember to look in the different services. So having that cross-listing would really open up research a lot. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I will check that. Oh, you so you. No, I'm sorry. So you talk about the restricted data, mm -hmm. you know, the secure data center. So I'm interesting who are eligible to access the data is only for the German citizen or the EU people or the if the uh, US researcher in the United States want to see the restrict data if they will to go to the your center they can access it um, so our data is well most of all we, we tailor or we target our services to the German researchers because they they pay us, but our data generally is, access, is, is accessible to everyone. We, I don't think we ever had any foreign researcher come to the secure data center yet because it's also uh, a bit far to travel for most of them, but I'm pretty sure it's accessible for foreigners as well. Thanks, Anya. It was a very interesting talk and n nice to hear what our European colleagues are doing as well. I have a follow-up question on, on restricted access and, and secure access data collections. Uh, you, you said that at the moment you physically have to visit GESIS to access those collections if you're eligible to do so, but you mentioned the possibility of having some kind of remote access mm -hmm. system in the future. Do you know where GESIS is with, with plans in that regard? Um, they're working on it for a while already. Um, I think the problem is still that you don't know what this person is doing in front of their computer if they're at home. So in the secure data center, you really cannot take your phone, your USB stick, anything with you, no camera. Um, we can't have this, you can't have this control with remote access. And maybe it's a bit, um, maybe we, don't really have this differentiation um, of different levels yet. So the secure data center data is very, um, very sensitive. And maybe this data will always remain in the physical enclave, just as uh, like here at ICPSR. Um, so far, I can't think of any data that we have that is um, suitable for remote access because we just don't have this distinction yet between these different 
access ways. But uh, yeah, Libby, uh, Libby Bishop is working on it, so um, uh, maybe she can tell you more, or I can I can get back to you and tell you more about it. Yeah, my question is about, you know, the contents that you have in your system. Uh, uh, do you actively seek out uh, materials or are you primarily just sort of waiting for researchers or institutions mm -hmm. to deposit with you? So um, in the past, it was more like a waiting position. Um, but it changed through the restructuring, it uh, changed quite a bit, so we still have a lot of incoming data just by itself, but we also developed towards uh, looking out what's there, um, what could be premium data that we can acquire and offer premium services to them to make it available. Unfortunately, um, there are a lot of researchers that come to us anyways to offer their data and they are aware of the data sharing and how important it is. When we find other very important data, these researchers often don't really appreciate the data sharing philosophy and they're very hesitant and they are very uh, yeah, worried about data protection. And so we have to actually work a lot on convincing them, unfortunately. Okay, anyone else? Well, good morning, everyone, and uh, thanks for having us here at uh, uh, this ICPSR meeting. It's always nice to be in Ann Arbor. Uh, now, I, want, I always like to start these things with a bit of um, interaction with the audience, but because it's early and it's the first session of the day, I'm not going to make it difficult for you. It's going to be really, really easy. Um, who in the audience today is registered with the UK Data Service and is already using the UK Data Service? Okay, there's a few hands there. That's good. That's positive. Who has at least heard of us but isn't using us? Okay, there's a few more. Okay. And where are the people who are completely clueless and have no idea what's going on? <laughs> yeah, me as well. Okay. <laughs> so this is a quick overview of, of, of what I'm going to be covering uh, uh, today. I'll introduce what the UK Data Service is, and I, do, and I do mean the UK Data Service, not the UK Data Archive. I will talk about the archive as well because that's where I work. I work at the UK Data Archive, but I work for the UK Data Service. And I'll explain how you can register and access material from us and go through some of the other additional supporting resources that we have for you. If you do download any material from us, then you know you do have access to a, a vast wealth of resources um, so that we can help you understand what you've, what you've got from us. I want to highlight some of our most important, most popular data collections, uh, things hopefully that even if the particular titles I mentioned to you aren't familiar. You're at least familiar with the kinds of data that, that I'm referring to, uh, so that you know you can think of what a US equivalent or what a North American equivalent would be. And I'll explain how you can keep in touch with us and, and get further, further help. Well, the UK Data Service is, uh, we think of it as a one-stop shop, and it's a comprehensive resource funded by the Economic and Social Research Council. I suppose the closest equivalent in the United States would be the National Science Foundation. And that's where our money comes from. And um, we are here to provide you with access um, to data for teaching and research and secondary analysis, and then to support you with whatever work you're doing or what your students are doing or your, the academics that you're supporting, um, what kind of work they're doing. And we're here, of course, to train and provide guidance on a very wide range of um, research data issues. Those, those of you who work with uh, ICPSR or are familiar with ICPSR's work, well, you know, we do broadly the same things. And you was talking about a lot of the activity at uh, GESIS, and um, those are all really familiar things to us too. And we want to be uh, developing best practice. Um, Anya mentioned you know, some of the problems of getting people to 
do the work early on during their academic projects to get data in good shape, make sure they have a good research data management plan. Um, that's really, really key because if you're funded by the ESRC in the UK, if you've got money for a, a project from um, uh, money from the ESRC for some academic project, you are obligated to share whatever data you collect at the end of that project and deposit, uh, deposit it with us at the UK Data Archive. Um, and you'd be amazed how many people get fundamental things wrong because they don't come to us early on in the process and talk to us and get some advice. You know, we are here to help uh, with those things, but um, um, you'd be amazed how many people um, do simple things, um, uh, simple things wrong. I'll come back to some of these things during the, the course of um, the talk here. Well, the UK Data Service um, has a number of different institutions involved in it, and depending on what kinds of data you're interested in using, you will get support and help from one of these different um, institutions. If you're using UK Survey Microdata, then um, we have specialists at the Cathy Marsh Institute at the University of Manchester who support that. Um, and then if you're using census resources, we have colleagues at University College London, Edina at the University of Edinburgh, uh, University of Southampton and JISC in Manchester as well. So depending on what kinds of census information or what kinds of aggregated data you're using, you can rely on help from one of these different different services. Uh, when I first started using Survey Microdata, I did register with the UK Data Archive. This is quite a long time ago. Um, and that was before the UK Data Service came into being in 2012 and before the, the, the previous service, the Economic and Social Data Service, came into being in 2003. So what that meant was, was I had access to the UK Data Archive, but I didn't have access to all of this expertise which exists in these other partner institutions. Um, the UK Data Archive is the largest service provider for the UK Data Service, and I'm just going to take a bit of time talking about, about the archive, uh, because I always get asked lots of questions about what we do and who we are and where we are. And so as it says on the slide, we are the... Uh, the curators of the uh, largest collection of social science and economic uh, research data, digital data in, in the UK. We are a department of the University of Essex. Uh, the University of Essex is very much uh, a social sciences institution and we benefit a lot um, from working with the academic departments there and um, we provide a lot of expertise to those departments. And we're celebrating our 50th anniversary this year um, so more youthful than um, ICPSR and, 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 and thesis. Um, and we're involved in all kinds of major projects. Um, Anya was already talking about CESDA. We're CESDA members as well. Um, and the UK Data Service is, of course, our, our biggest project, but we also um, coordinate the administrative data service as well from, from the UK Data Archive. Um, so I'm just going to tell you a little bit of story about how we came into being because this is just this just kind of explains where we are and, and, and how we came about. It was in the sort of mi early to mid 1960s that the um, the Economic and Social Research Council, or at least whatever the ESRC was called back then, started to notice that research data were being lost in the UK. You know, they were funding these projects and data weren't being shared. Work was being replicated. Some of the data was being sold to institutions elsewhere as well. So they set up a committee to look into the possibility of setting up uh, some kind of archive, and they invited proposals. And um, some bids came in. Um, there were three that made it to the final shortlist. The first one came from uh, a department called Policy and Economic Planning, and they were based at the LSE. There was a second one which came from the research funders themselves. They had an interesting idea, which was, well, we're funding the research. It makes sense that all of the data comes back to us, and we look after it. And then the third bid came from these uh, promising up-and-comers, these upstarts from the University of Essex, a very young institution. It had only been around for a couple of years back then. Now, um, it became quite clear after a while that locating the UK Data Archive in London was going to be really quite expensive. The PEP bid was based at the LSC, and it kind of relied on the fact that, well, you know, we're the LSC, we're in London, we're important, we should host this thing. Um, yes, the Social Sciences uh, Research Council bid was more interesting, it relied on the fact that, you know, well, we're funding this, so we should hold it. Um, but they didn't really have the accommodation, and it was going to be expensive, and they didn't have the computing infrastructure there either. So it sort of became apparent quite soon that the University of Essex was the leading um, institution in this particular process. So 
So PEP and the research fund has actually got together um, to try and um, defeat this bid from Essex. And um, well, it didn't work out. It was going to be too expensive. Uh, the, research, uh, the computing infrastructure didn't exist at the time at those institutions. Um, so um, the, the data archive came to the University of Essex. Um, an unkind person would say that's because LSE stands for Loser School of Economics. I, I wouldn't do that. I, you know, I wouldn't do that. You know, even though I'm a three-time graduate of a political science department at Essex, a rival department, I wouldn't say anything um, so disparaging about our colleagues um, at the LSE. Lawrence Horton isn't here, so I can get away with saying that. Um, those of you who are involved in ISIS will know him. Um, so, um, the University of Essex then, where on earth is that? Well, if you're in central London and you drive northeast for 50, 55 miles, you come to a, a Roman town called Colchester. It's Britain's oldest recorded town. Some people around here have been there, I know. And um, the University of Essex sits on the edge of Colchester in Wivenhoe Park. And this is Wivenhoe Park. Um, looks idyllic, doesn't it? Well, I mean, this is how it looked to John Constable in 1816. Um, there aren't cows anymore, but there are geese and ducks and swans and lots of rabbits and squirrels. Um, this is the more modern day view of, of the University of Essex. And um, I don't know if I can do this here. Does this work? Yeah, so the data archive is there. And uh, we're right on the edge here. And this, this photograph here is actually about three or four years old, but there's at least four new buildings that have grown up since this was taken. And it gets bigger all the time. Uh, to the north, you can see here the town of, 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 of Colchester. Um, another interesting, f oops, I'll just go back one. Up here, you've got an old house, Rivenhoe House, which was built in 1759 by the landowners of Rivenhoe Park at the time. Um, you can actually see it there, just about. It's that red blob there. It's not a very high resolution image. But that house has been there for. Um, 250 years, and it has an interesting history. During the Second World War, it was requisitioned by the British Army, and it actually became the headquarters of the SAS. Um, the SAS aren't there anymore, and that, that particular building is now a hotel. It's actually a teaching hotel, and it's a really, really nice place to stay if you ever come and visit us at, uh, at the University of Essex. So these are the kinds of data that you can access from um, the UK Data Service. Um, lots of big micro data surveys there. Uh, we also have various international macro data resources based on things like data from OECD, UN, World Bank, International Energy Agency, things like that. There are all kinds of census resources for aggregate statistics, flow data, census micro data. We've got census micro data at the moment from 1991 to 2011. We're expecting more. Uh, for earlier periods to come along. And we also have a lot of uh, qualitative and mixed methods uh, data resources as well. For those of you who are here for the OR, OR bootcamp yesterday, you'll have heard Ron talk about um, the fact that we have quite a lot of qualitative collections as well. Now, the different collections that we have have different levels of access. And those three icons that you can see at the top indicate what, what level of access um, they sit under. Obviously, there's lots of open, freely available to all collections. But then beyond that, we have what we call safeguarded collections, which at the very least are, uh, require you to register with um, the UK Data Service and accept our end user license. And that simply just means that you, know, you, you promise that you won't pass on these data to unauthorized parties. You won't try to um, identify any individual from the, the microdata, things like that. And then beyond that, you might have some additional agreements. Some of them are just, you know, click licenses. Some of them might require that you fill out uh, an additional form and get permission from the original depositor. Um, some of those are restricted only to researchers in the UK. Um, and that kind of links to um, some of the restrictions that we have on controlled data. These are the most highly sensitive, most highly restricted data collections that we have that sit in our, in our secure lab. Uh, Anya was talking about their research data enclave that they have physically at GESIS. Um, with our most restricted data collections, we do provide remote access um, to these, to researchers based in UK institutions, UK institutions that receive money from the ESRC in particular. 
And the reason for that is not because we wouldn't want to give any of you or any researchers in other, um, in other countries access to these data collections. The reason for the restriction is that there has to be some sanction that can be applied against you. And if you're from an institution that doesn't receive money from the ESRC, then you know if you misuse the data, then there's no penalty that can be applied um, against you. Um, so if you are from a, a UK academic department and you misuse what we have in the secure lab, and we do, you know, we do spot things that go wrong um, occasionally, nothing very serious, but we do occasionally ban individual departments. Um, I don't think any department has yet had ESRC funding withheld completely, but you don't want to be that academic who, you know, takes something out of the secure lab, reports it without, you know, without us having checked it. And then for all of your colleagues in your department suddenly to have all of their funding cut off because of one stupid mistake that you made. So um, I am going to talk just a little bit about that because even though it's not accessible to anyone out of the outside of the UK, just because um, it is really, really important resource. Um, we think um, we're doing quite well in, in relation to supplying access to these materials, but it is incredibly resource intensive. The way that we set up our our secure lab, um, first of all, you have to go through an extensive half day of face to face training that we hold in London a couple of times a month uh, where you're taught, you know, this is what you should do. This is what you shouldn't do. Um, we teach you how to understand statistical disclosure control. I.e., If you're reporting statistics, these are the, the parameters that you have to adhere to. Or if you're doing any kind of complex econometric modeling, these are the kind of coefficients that you should withhold um, in order to ensure that your output is safe. And only when we're satisfied, and we physically check twice, you know, with real people, um, everything, every single thing that's that's produced that a researcher wants to um, have released from um, the secure lab. It's incredibly resource intensive work. But I do have to mention it because it's my team, you know, my staff who actually perform that work, and um, I want to take my hat off to them because they do an amazing job. So when I talk about the UK Data Service, a lot of people say, yeah, but I'm not based in the UK. How can I get access to it? Well, it doesn't matter. You know, anyone can register with the UK Data Service. If you're outside of the UK higher education system, it just means there's an extra step that you have to go through. And that step is to um, apply for a username from the UK Data Archive. There's the URL um, to do that. And if you apply for um, uh, credentials that way, you'll get an automated message back that says, oh, we'll, we'll deal with this in three days. Usually it's the next day that someone uh, will supply your, your UK Data Archive credentials. And then you can use that to log in, uh, complete a registration form. And then within minutes, you can be downloading to your own desktop any one of 7,000 data collections. Within minutes, literally. It's that easy. You just need to complete the registration form and accept that end user license. And then once you've got access to your material, we are here to, to help you understand what you've got. You know, we receive thousands and thousands and thousands of data queries every single year. Typically, they're you know asking questions about, do you have data on this? Where can I find you know whatever it is? Uh, and then um, those people who are using data, they have questions about how to analyze what they've got, how to understand things, how you know why is this documentation file missing? What on earth does this variable mean? You know, things like that. We, we deal with these questions all the time. Um, obviously, there are lots of questions about research data management as well, trying to explain to people what their legal obligations are. This is what you should and shouldn't do. And then, of course, um, the secure lab um, support takes up a lot of our time. Um, we're creating resources online all the time. There were lots of video tutorials, written guides, um, and then we produce data for the classroom as well. You know, this is something that we try to encourage um, uh, instructors and teachers to do is to come to us, use materials that they find in our data collections. Uh, we have lots of specific data data collections that they can use in the classroom. But we also encourage people to create their own um, uh, instructional materials and then send them back to us and deposit, deposit it with us. Um, some people might find that there's a particular survey that they like, but it's you know, it's got thousands of, of variables in there. There's millions of cases. And you don't want to start with that. You know, if you're teaching undergraduates who are new to this sort of thing, you don't necessarily want to start off with a data collection that contains millions of cells. You maybe want to cut it down. And if you don't find anything that meets your requirements, oh, why don't you, why don't you create your own one? Send us the syntax. We'll, we'll recreate it. And then maybe you can deposit it with us. 
And then we also do lots of face-to-face -face training events across the UK as well. We talk to academics and students and librarians and other researchers explaining, explaining to them what we have, just, just as we're doing today. So here are some of the, the, the most widely used, most popular data collections that we have. There might be some, some names up there which are familiar to you. Um, in the session that's following, um, I know that there's going to be a talk from ISR and they're going to be talking about some of their projects. I looked at some of the, the surveys that are mentioned there. Well, we have UK equivalents of those. I mean, uh, the American National Election Study is one um, where we have the British Election Study at the UK Data Archive. It's not listed up there, but that's one that, um, that's very popular. It's one that I know very well. Um, another one that was mentioned was the, is it the Health and Retirement Study? The English equivalent of that is the English Longitudinal Study of Aging, ELSA. Um, lots of you will be familiar with the Panel Study of Income Dynamics. Um, the UK equivalent of that would be the British Household Panel Study and now Understanding Society. Uh, the BHPS started in 1991 following 5,500 households, 12,000 individuals. That went for 18 years. That survey has now morphed into, has now combined into the UK Household Longitudinal Study as well. Um, they're aiming for 100,000 individuals in that, 40,000 households. It's one of the biggest household panel surveys in the world, and it covers a really, really broad range of topics. The first three surveys up there were birth cohorts. Um, the National Child Development Study started in 1958, following 17,000 children born in one week in 1958. They're approaching their 60th birthdays now. There's been nine, nine sweeps of data of that so far. The 1970 cohort is a follow-up study, and then the Millennium Cohort is another one. Uh, children born in 2000, 2001. Um, and then the bottom two there are um, uh, cohort studies of, of, of young people. We're going to get access, hopefully, to um, a new study of um, ageing in Scotland. It's called um, Healthy Ageing in Scotland. It gives you the rather amusing acronym of HAGIS, uh, which is really, really good. <laughs> Don't have data from it yet, but we're expecting it uh, quite soon. <laughs> I think haggis is banned in the United States, isn't it? You can get it in Canada, can't you? But uh, I don't think you can get it in the United States. Go, go over the border if you want to sample some great uh, Scottish cuisine. And then we have lots of international macro data. These are the data banks uh, which are based on um, IMF, OECD, World Bank, UN uh, uh, sources. Most of those are open. They used to be restricted to people just in UK higher education, but most of these now are open. There are some restrictions relating to international energy agency data and um, UN data, but a, a, a lot more of these materials are now freely accessible to anyone. And you just look at them in your own web browser. That's the .stat interface that you can see there. Uh, you don't need any special software to actually start building up tables and things like that. And then we have uh, data from the UK Census. Um, we're going to get more micro data, so that time, time frame will expand eventually. Um, aggregate statistics, you can use an online tool called Infuse and get and build up your tables using Infuse. Um, the boundary data sources that are supplied and supported by Edina at the University of Edinburgh, a lot of those are open. There are lots of shape files and things like that, you know, if, uh, that, that are completely open. Some of them are restricted, so some of them are behind a login, and that login will identify if you're in the UK higher education system or not. The flow data supported by UCL are mostly restricted only to researchers in the UK, but then there are some microdata sources that are available more widely. If you do want to start exploring some of these sections, I always tell some of these um, uh, collections of data, I always tell people that a good place to start is on our key data page. So if you go to the UK Data Service homepage, it's three steps to get there. You want to first start on the get data item right at the top of the page, then select key data on the left there, and then use those tabs in the middle to search through whichever so topic it is. You've got UK surveys, cross-national surveys, longitudinal, international macro data, census, collie, and, and, and so on and so forth. And then they're all listed underneath. And that's, I think that's the good, a, a good place to start. You can, of course, use the, the search tool. Uh, it's, on the, it's on the front page there. Just type in a, a term and then use the facets on the left-hand side to um, start targeting your search more, more precisely according to spatial uh, identifier or, or time frame or whatever it happens to be. I don't need to explain how to do that to a bunch of librarians, I'm sure. Uh, and then we also have the variable and question and question bank as well. So you can search according to the text from, from questions and, and um, that have been asked in those surveys. We're very, very interested to know what people are doing with 
um, with data. Um, so if any of you are inspired to go away after this and actually start using our resources, get in touch with us. Let us know what you've been up to, um, whether you've been um, su supporting data um, for, for teaching or research, or you've done some work of your own. Um, and let us know if you've um, created any publications. I mean, it's part of our end user license that um, if you do create a publication, you let us know so that we can add it to the online catalog. You know, it's a win-win situation for everybody. It promotes your work. It, you know, makes it more visible to everybody. And um, we'd love to feature any of you in a case study if you've been doing something interesting. So do please let us know. We'll tweet about it and um, share it with the world. Just want to take a little, uh, little bit of time here just to explain the kinds of things that we're up to at the moment. Uh, UK Data Service Phase 2 actually began this month. Uh, UK Data Service Phase 1 uh, ran from um, October 2012 up until uh, September 2017. Uh, we're now in Phase 2, and the biggest sort of change in activity uh, for Phase 2 will be that we will now integrate into census support um, more fully than we have done before. And the other activity that we've been working on quite recently is, is our user experience program. This is being headed up by Catherine McNeil, who some of you will know, um, who previously was at MIT, is now uh, my manager at the UK Data Service, and she's been looking extensively at uh, you know what people are doing with with our materials and, and and developing this user experience program. We've had a survey that's been running on our web pages for the last few weeks. I think it closed a couple of days ago. When I last checked, it had had something like eight or eight or nine hundred responses. So there should be some good materials in there. Um, do please stay in touch. Here are some ways in which you can and do that. Um, like I said, we're very interested to know what people are doing with, with our material. Um, sign up to the mailing list to, to stay in touch with new data collections and new activities. And I'm very happy to take any questions if you have any. Thank you. No, okay, that's easy. <laughs> oh, it's one. <laughs> no one else is going to ask a question. I, I forgive me uh, for monopolizing the Q and A, but uh, you you have a brilliant website. I enjoy searching on your website, you know, uh, just to see what's up there, and uh, I just really applaud what you've done. Um, my question has to do with the labor force surveys. Okay. I, I just went up there and looked, and you have both the Eurostat version and the UK version, and you caution that the two are not comparable. And I'm just wondering, you know, what, what's the issue there? Um, this is really a question for my colleagues at the University of Manchester, but um, with, with the Eurostat, uh, that's part of a wider research program that they have where they've tried to harm harmonize quite a lot of the, the material. Um, we only have actually the UK element of that particular survey, um, the, the, the cross-European one, if you like. Um, if you do want access to the, the European Labour Force surveys, you actually have to go directly to Eurostat and negotiate access with them. So our collections only include the UK element of the Eurostat survey. Um, as far as comparability goes, I'm not, n I'm not sure what the issues would be there. Um, but you can get the UK quarterly labor force survey from the UK data service. That's not a problem. Um, I, I can't give you a more expert answer than that, I'm afraid. But thank you for the uh, comments about the website. I will pass that on to the comms team. I'm around for the rest of the meeting. If anyone has any questions, do please feel free to come up and, and, and ask whatever you like. Thank you. Yep. For your aggregate data, the sense data, so you have the GI data to match the sense data? The, oh, sorry. Yeah. OK. So for your aggregate data, the sense data, mm -hmm. so do we have the GIs map to match the sense data at different years? And what kind of scale you yeah, have? Um, we do have. Um, shape files and, and mapping uh, tools uh, to use with the census macro data. Um, those are supported by our colleagues at Edina at the University of Edinburgh. Um, I think it should go back to 1981, uh -huh. but I'm, I'm not 100% sure about that. What's an oyster, the boundary? Uh, oh, 2011. 
Is a tractor, is any kind of similar to tractor block kind of neighbors? Yeah. Okay. 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 We'll continue this later. Okay. <laughs> Thank you.